Well, Lieutenant General Mark C. Schwartz, welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Great to be here, John. Thank you. Uh, you and I first met when last month you spoke at the Denver Council on Foreign Relations. And the topic of your talk was your last assignment in the military. You served as the United States Security Coordinator for Israel and Palestine. And it was a fascinating talk. It was extremely well received and it stimulated a great deal of discussion. Um, but I would like to take the time to get to know you as a person. And, and, and you are a fellow Coloradan and you grew up in Colorado. Where did you grow up? So I grew, I was born in Swedish hospital in Ingle, Inglewood. And then we moved at the age of three uh, up to Longmont because my father was working in Boulder, Colorado at uh, the new uh, um, factory, I guess, um, of IBM that was uh, put on between Longmont and Boulder, Colorado. So yeah. I lived in Longmont pretty much my entire childhood before I went off to college. Did you have uh, relatives or was your father in the military? My grandfather, my dad's father, he was drafted at the age of 28 in, in World War II. And so fortunately, he didn't go in until 44 after most of the you know combat operations had been completed. And certainly my childhood and interacting with him, although he didn't, you know, not that he didn't want to talk about his experiences in World War II, that they were, you know, bad or tragic. He just didn't talk a lot about it, but he did provide me, you know, fun little military equipment to play around with. And uh, I did have an interest in the military as a result of my grandfather and certainly have some mementos from his service. Um, but really, I didn't uh, think about joining the military uh, until I was in college about my junior year. And one of my very good friends was uh, made the decision to join Reserve Officer Training Corps. And then I also had the Professor of Military Science, which is the senior active duty officer in one of my business courses. And so they were actively uh, recruiting individuals that may have some desire to join the military. And so I, I got to know both of uh, Monty, my friend's experiences and how much he enjoyed it. And also the professor of military science certainly influenced me to, to join for a whole host of reasons. So I, I just had a hunch that you were ready to get out of Colorado uh, and so you went to Idaho State, right, to get a degree in finance? Well, I went to Idaho State for, <laughs> I wish I could be that genuine that it was a result of <laughs> wanting to get a degree in finance. But because uh, I actually was going to go into uh, special education uh, when I w went to college because of my experience in high school working with uh, gifted children. Um, but I really went there to follow my brother because we both got football scholarships to Idaho State University. So uh, nice. not really academics that drove me to go to Idaho State. But you know, ultimately, yeah. yes, I did change my major to finance and uh, you know graduated uh, in '88 from, or excuse me, um, '87 from from Idaho State. Yes. Did you go right into the military then? I did not. I actually was. Um, dating a lady, a young lady at the time, and uh, she didn't really want uh, to see me go into the military on, on active duty. So I actually turned down the opportunity initially. Um, I did very well in ROTC and, you know, was selected to go on active duty and my branch of choice, uh, profession of choice within the military, but I turned it down because, uh, you know, there wasn't a desire for who I thought I was going to be with um, at the time. So I ended up having to recompete. To I joined the National Guard in Idaho, went to school at a bank as a loan officer trainee, and then waited about eight months and had the opportunity when I went to my first officer training at Fort Knox, Kentucky to compete to get on active duty. Because I knew truly in my heart that that's what I wanted to do. And so thank goodness that all worked out. And I got the opportunity to go on active duty in uh, March of, of 89, actually. And uh, served almost 34 years on active duty from that point. Wow, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, you were a Green Beret, correct? Yes, that's correct. And, and you it, you were part of every echelon of, of uh, special operations, as I understand it. What does that mean? So I 
first off, to start out as a Green Bray as an officer, if you're a if you're enlisted or you know a private or a sergeant, you can actually go into that profession um, as soon as you enter the military. You can apply for it. For officers, you have to wait until uh, you're selected for promotion to captain. So it's what's called a non-accession branch. So I started out as an armor officer, served in Korea, but I knew because of my experience with a senior and non-commissioned officer at my ROTC program, and then several that I interacted with when I went to training as a cadet um, in Fort, what was then Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, that I wanted to apply for special forces. So I did, um, was accepted, was, you know, assessed, screened, graduated um, in 93, December of 93. And then, you know, you have a, like every profession, you have a series of um, key developmental assignments that you do throughout the course of your career. And depending on how long you stay in and certain uh, uh, selection opportunities to, particularly with respect to command, you get opportunities to serve at, at you know, at, at every echelon. And so for me, I, I started out as a, like every other Green Beret, as a captain commanding a special forces um, operational detachment. And I commanded at the major level of a special forces company at the battalion level. I, I actually went into the, our training institution, which was extremely rewarding assignment to, to train new Green Berets and their military occupational specialties. And I did that as a battalion commander. Then I had the opportunity to uh, command the third special forces group, which is the Colonel. And that's, you know, really in terms of special forces uh, assignments, that's that's really the culmination as where you're a Green Beret before you make general officer to go, if, you, if you're so fortunate, which I was, to command other special operations organizations, uh, joint and coalition um, as, a, as a general officer. And so I, I served as a deputy for several organizations uh, within special operations. And then I, I commanded uh, Special Operations Command Europe, which was a, a superb opportunity uh, to serve there. And then I was the deputy commander at the Joint Special Operations Command, which is our, our nation's premier counterterrorism uh, force uh, that you know answers the call when we have uh, Americans that are in, in harm's way uh, around the globe, among many other responsibilities that they have. And then, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, I culminated my assignment after being at the Joint Special Operations Command, serving in Israel, not a special operations assignment, but very appropriate for a career Green Beret because of the responsibilities of working with the Palestinian Authority Security Forces in developing not only their tactical capability, but more importantly, their institutional, uh, you know, Ministry of Interior and other Ministry of Intelligence and other um, entities within the Palestinian Authority to mature and, and build a sustainable uh, security institution for, you know, for the Palestinian people in, in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. What do you attribute your success in the military to? I think it was really a combination of four things. First off, um, I performed well, which you have to, right? So merit matters most, um, certainly. So I had... Um, opportunities that were provided to me, which was another key, uh, you know, individuals that see potential in you have to create opportunities for you, not only within, you know, what are the core, those key developmental positions, but also opportunities to serve maybe outside of the branch and get you exposure. So I, I was blessed with mentorship throughout my career when I, it was happening even before I really understood the importance of it. Um, yeah in broadening assignments. And then certainly uh, I, I had the potential. So that was, that was key. Um, and then there is, there is some luck and timing involved as well. So I, you know, when you go before um, centralized promotion boards or selection boards, uh, the makeup of that board, having individuals that know you, particularly as a, as you're, you know, taking that really strategic step to become a general officer, that that's very key. And I had just again, some superb uh, leaders who I had worked for multiple times, and coincidentally, you know, they had they had served in some of those positions and in those selection boards, and they did a great job of, as all leaders should do, um, you know, for those that have that, that you see potential, and I certainly did it as a general officer and even as a colonel of making sure individuals that 
um, are going to be their their peer group or even superiors get to know individuals that you know should have opportunities or be provided opportunities to demonstrate their potential. And so I was I was very blessed, and I had leaders that, that looked out for me uh, throughout the course of my career. Mm -hmm. And you, in turn, did the same. I did. Who, yeah. who yeah. reported to you? Yeah, and I still do it. I mean, even when I'm now that I'm out of you know, active service, uh, there's folks that I still follow closely. And, um, you know, I'm always happy to, if, if they need assistance and um, positions that they're interested in, if I know individuals that are still on active service, or even if I don't, I can say, you know, for my time in serving with this individual that um, I, I think they'd be a great fit for, you know, X position, because it does take, you know, it does take a sponsorship uh, advocacy and mentorship, uh, particularly when you're going outside of uh, what we call in in the U.S. military broadening assignments, going out of those core positions that are inherent to being a you know whatever your your branch is, finance, um, ordnance, transportation, infantry, special forces. You you've got to reach out to those leaders that are 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 in charge of those other organizations that you want to get your officers exposed to. Uh, so that they can see the broader potential that they they offer to the United States military. You also uh, went back to to school, University of North Carolina, if I'm not mistaken, and received a master's degree. Is that correct? Well, I went back to school at as part of the professional military education. It was at the Naval War College, actually. So I, mm -hmm. uh, many do get the opportunity or, or take it upon themselves. Um, I, I didn't have that level of. Uh, <laughs> personal uh, initiative, I would say, to uh, get my master's degree outside of uh, my, you know, the normal education right. pipeline that you have for officers. But I went to the Naval War College and, and received mine in uh, international relations and national security, which is just a phenomenal year, uh, surrounded by not only um, superb PhDs that come from a whole host of institutions with all of our all of our colleges uh, and, and the, the Naval War College was just fantastic, but also some great, some great officers that uh, are part of the, the permanent faculty as well. So uh, a great year of uh, reflection and introspection and, and then an opportunity to, to learn, you know, really at the operational strategic level as, as a senior uh, lieutenant colonel. So about 20, 20 years in the military at that point. I think I was thinking of uh, the. You did a couple of certificate programs for executives that uh, of North Carolina and Wharton, mm -hmm. um, and and I just got that confused. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and that's another great thing about the 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 general the Army general officer and even joint education for general officers and flag officers that there are these programs for the general officer education to go and attend these uh, different. Uh, organizations spend a week or you know uh, four to five days and, and again be surrounded by experts in their field whether right. it's talking about leadership or organizational design etc mm -hmm. you have a family i do you now yes. live in colorado springs and i know you have a daughter right because you had posted something regarding an achievement that she had if i'm not mistaken what was yeah, that so I have so two kids, two wonderful kids and a wonderful wife. And um, I give my wife, Allison, all the credit for, you know, raising them, given how much I was gone during the course yeah. of their early childhood. Right. Just, uh, remarkable. But yeah, my son is um, on the, the final process of becoming a physical therapist. And then my daughter, um, very proud of her, proud of both of them. Um, she decided to join JROTC in high school when we were in mm -hmm. Stuttgart living there. And then she ended up uh, getting an ROTC scholarship at Colorado State University, graduated there. And she's now a military intelligence officer in the U.S. Army Reserves. And she's married to a fellow lieutenant um, as well, who's an armor officer. So following in my tracks, just coincidentally, I did, certainly didn't drive into that. But yeah, so Megan and my daughter is as a young second lieutenant, um, and she'll go off to her initial training here in the spring, which is which is wonderful. And uh, again, real proud of both of my kids and everything they've accomplished to date. So, Mark, you are so positive, and 
you know, just just being around you, you, your optimism comes through. But I know that you've had obstacles along the way, too. What to, what kind of obstacles did you have to encounter during the course of your military career? Well, I think like most uh, um, individuals in any profession, you have situations where you're not necessarily working for um an individual that uh, you may aspire to want to be um, right. or, you know, you have challenges. And so I, I certainly faced that uh, early in my career. Uh, my first assignment in Korea, in fact, um, I had an interesting uh, commander that I worked for there and didn't really have the respect of the organization. And that happened a couple of times throughout my career. But, you know, to your point about being positive and optimistic, it's essential for a leader. And yeah. what I learned early on from, you know, mentors like, you know, gentlemen like HR McMaster, who was actually one of our advisors when I just started out as a second lieutenant and Tony Schwalm yeah. was like, look, affect, you know, affect the organization and those that, that are underneath your charge. And, you know, your job as a leader is to serve as really a filter from, you know, negative influence or even even challenges. And there's you're going to be asked a lot of times to do things that you may not um, want to do or that you may not agree with. But it's your job as a leader to work your team through that. And so I, I was fortunate that I had, you know, leaders like the two gentlemen I mentioned and, and many others, but uh, they really set the tone for me. And then I think another key leader for me was a guy named Joe Whitley, who was my battalion commander. So my first, you know, commander when I was a young captain team leader, and I, I just saw the amount of work he put into learning, uh, you know, about every person in his command. So you're talking, you know, 300 and some odd folks in, in the battalion organizations at that time, which is pretty significant. And you know, he instilled that in us in terms of the attitude you need to bring to work every day, how you need to be, you know, what we call now intrusive in terms of um, learning and your, your people, learning about their families and, and creating an environment where people enjoy coming, you know, coming to work. So um, like I think a lot of folks, when you when you get the opportunity to serve for someone like that, it has a profound influence on shaping you early on as a leader and so i was i was blessed with that um as, as a young lieutenant as a young captain and i tried to emulate their leadership you know those positive influencers in my life as important <laughs> those that i necessarily didn't like some of their leadership traits and attributes i tried to avoid and uh i think it mm. worked out pretty well yeah yeah but the focus uh, for you has always been people you know, there, there's so much you needed to know in the military, and you worked and traveled throughout the world, but you always come back to understanding your folks and what their needs are and inspiring them. That seems to be who you are and, and your primary focus. Well, the especially as you get more senior, um, mm -hmm. the, the level of functional competencies that are required um, and, and really the, the, the professionals that you need to have around you to effectively lead large organizations. Um, yeah, there are some, there are some un unique folks that just have incredible acumen for all types of uh, different functional competencies, whether that has to do with finance or logistics. And I'm speaking mainly military, but there's great application for this, I think in the civilian sector. Um, cybersecurity, how to, how to work talent management, operations, strategic planning. And while I had experiences in a lot of these areas, there's many that I did not. And mm -hmm. so what, what I re quickly realized and watching, again, leaders that I wanted to emulate was that, you know, you don't have to be the expert or, or come off as you are, but you have to be a, a really good listener and you have to, you know, give your people the time to um, that they deserve because they put so much work into becoming competent in whatever particular acumen that they're responsible for. And if you leverage that and, you know, foster that in inclusiveness and, and teamwork um, at every level, entry level management, I think mid-level, and certainly when you hit senior level or even the C-suite, it, it'll pay dividends for you. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, 
you know, there's all types of talented people out there and organizations have great, you know, access to talent um, while it is competitive. But uh, if it really comes down to how you create a culture of within your organization of all those those folks that are going to inform decisions that you're going to be charged with making uh, mm -hmm. or strategy that you're going to develop as a leader mm -hmm. and giving them the time. And I think I was successful in doing that. And I, I hope to, you know, carry that forward as I have now transitioned into, uh, into civilian life. Recently, you introduced me to the, our national security strategy document that was published recently. And, and I spent the, uh, the last weekend reading it be, because of you, you know, and something I had never done before, but that served as an inspiration to you. Did it not? When you were in the military, you looked for that each year, I assume. And, uh, and that sets the direction of our nation in so many ways. I thought it was elegantly written and well-written. Um, is that what other, See, we have that document and what other documents inspired you and provided you with guidance throughout your career? Well, as a young officer or even a young sergeant, you're not typically looking for those level strategic documents. You know, right. as you as you raise up in your profession and the more experience you get, you realize the more important uh, those documents are to shape right. a strategy and policy. So the national security strategy obviously informs our national military strategy, our national intelligence uh, strategy that's developed by the, the intelligence community uh, led by the director of national intelligence. And so that it is a, you know, it is an extremely important document. Um, and obviously there's sensitive or classified elements of the strategy that aren't unveiled to the, to the public, but right. um, there are many, there are many documents um, that, that are important, obviously, um, departments and agencies will shape their uh, strategies and, and the direction they're going to go based on, you know, the, the president, vice president's publication of the national security strategy. Um, and it doesn't come out, it doesn't come out every year. Um, it, it'll come out typically for the tenure of an administration. If there's a major shift in strategic focus or direction by a, uh, the administration, then you, you'll see it a public, uh, you know, a publication or a revision of, of strategy, obviously based on, you know, what's going on in this case, and, you know, both domestic and, and world, world events. But uh, it is, I think it, I think it's very well written myself. Um, most of them are, um, I don't, there was nothing in there that I don't think is really um, surprising, but I, I do compliment you one for taking the time to read it. Uh, there's so much uh, that is published out there that, that the average, I think, uh, public do not take the opportunity to, you know, read and, and understand. Uh, they get their, you know, our strategy based on what's what's happening out in, in the media. And sometimes, you know, that's, uh, they may be ill-informed if they don't really understand the, the full context of, you know, the direction that, you know, any administration may be going with respect to how we're investing um, the, uh, the deployment and employment of our military um, internationally, as well as, you know, where we're putting our, our priorities from a foreign policy standpoint, you know, if you, if you look at our State Department. So it, it is a very comprehensive document with respect to what else it informs for all the other departments and agencies, uh, you know, within the, uh, you know, with, within the United States government. You and I have uh, had the good fortune to travel a great deal around the world and um, and to interact with people from different societies, you in the military, me uh, in business. But, um, you know, I, I'm very proud of our country, but I'm also concerned about it now, as so many of us are. And, uh, and so I wonder what I can do as an individual. I'm not a politician. I'm I'm in I'm a businessman who has had a long career in business. And I wonder, as a citizen, what I can do uh, to help our country continue to thrive uh, into the future. And this is one of the ways I think. So when you suggested that I read this document, I, I, I appreciate that because we need to know what other ways we as citizens 
can um, besides voting to um, to make good decisions to to uh, help our country. Mm -hmm. Well, as you mentioned, the opportunity to serve outside of the United States and work with uh, you know broad coalitions. The one key takeaway that I didn't have an appreciation for, certainly as a young officer, that was just reinforced as I became more senior is the desire for the United States to lead globally. And, you know, even outside of, you know, alliances like, like NATO, um, all of our partners and friends around the world, they, they generally do look for the United States to lead. And our ability to lead and influence, uh, unfortunately, um, over the course of the last several years has, has waned some because of, I think the uh, very uh, polar, you know, partisan uh, views on certain issues, both domestically and internationally, and and that's that's not healthy. Um, I I do think that it's real important um, to you know be informed, and you know, there's a, a lot of sources of information that are out there. The media and, and social media specifically are, you know. I think, unfortunately, the primary way in which, you know, U.S. citizens do get informed on, on what's happening domestically and, and internationally. And I think individuals, uh, young adults, and, and certainly even before they, they reach adulthood, should be encouraged to do a lot more reading and versus just listening to, um, you know, different pundits and, and give their perspective. Because right. I think you'll find that most of them don't really have the background and, and they're being fed talking points, obviously, for um, and it's the, the motivations for uh, gaining, you know, uh, or increasing your viewer audience may not be the right motivations for uh, the information that, that you're putting out, uh, for instance. So I think that is, that is really important. But I think as, as citizens, and I, I'm going to speak to this when I get the opportunity to speak on uh, Veterans Day at the University of Colorado, is that you know, I think veterans are, are unique, and I would say even the broader civil society is we do have a responsibility to demonstrate the same character and values that, you know, of why we entered the military, why we stayed, whether we stayed for, you know, three to four years. And I think just the ability to act civil to one, the, you know, to one another um, is, is really important. And I think anyone who has served in uh, served their nation, whether it's in the military or any, you know, government um, agency um, department has an opportunity to to demonstrate and and foster that within within civil society once they transition. So I, I think you have an opportunity when you're out of the military to to be more vocal um, on the importance of that, and, and I certainly intend to do that throughout uh, you know the coming the coming months and years. I can only imagine that you learned a great deal about conflict resolution. Uh, when serving in Israel and with as the representative also to the Palestinian Authority, what what lessons can you take away from that experience? Well, first, you have to have willing partners to, to actually enter into strategic dialogue. And, you know, during my time uh, in um, Israel, obviously, the uh, foreign administration, um, based on the direction they were going with the peace pro not the peace process, but a uh, pro you know peace and prosperity uh, uh, um, framework that they they produced really from the Palestinians' point of view and and, and many others um, alienated the Palestinian Authority and really would just kind of took one kind of lopsided uh, strategic direction with respect to um, a, a two state solution and so when you don't have the two principal uh, parties participating in the dialogue, <laughs> you're probably not going to be successful. And as, yeah. as predicted by so many, when the, the, uh, the deal for peace and prosperity was released, it kind of fell on deaf ears with, with respect to the Palestinian authority. And no, no one was surprised by that. I don't think mm -hmm. um, the other one is, is that um, to my you know, earlier point, while there's, you know, the United Nations has representation there, um, obviously there's multiple uh, allies and partners of the United States and, and Israel that are trying to work on creating an environment um, for peace. Um, ultimately, the United States influence matters the most. And I, I didn't have a sense for how 
profound um, our influence was both with the Palestinian Authority and with um, you know Israel, but even more broadly, those that you know that want to uh, to see peace ultimately uh, you know uh, be achieved in um, in the West Bank and, and in Israel, and, and maybe ultimately someday a, a two state solution. So mm -hmm. that's specific to that conflict. I certainly learned it. And then the last point I would make in terms of conflict resolution and just conflict in general, I certainly learned a great deal uh, during my multiple uh, rotations in, in Afghanistan specifically, but also Iraq. I only did one, one there, but I was involved in, with different headquarters for forces that were involved there. But, that, you know, if the national will and the resolve of, of a people is far more important than any military capability or even broader coalition that is supporting you know a um, a nation um, to achieve peace and security in, in their own country and you know we saw that play out obviously in, in Iraq uh, when we withdrew out of there in 2011 built a, a very capable um, military and security forces there and ultimately uh, you know in 14 15 we saw what happened with when, when ISIS came in and, and, and almost overtook, could have overtaken the country had the United States and, you know, our key allies and partners not stepped in there. And then in Afghanistan, again, you know, I, I've spoken on this a couple of times and it's, I'm not unique. I don't think in this view as a former senior military leader, but if you look at the capabilities that we provided um, the Afghan security forces, the intelligence community, special operations forces, police special uh, forces, um, both in equipment, training, and education, relative to you know where the Taliban, the Haqqani network were in 2001, up until when we left um, a little over a year ago now, um, we, we, we made significant investment in the Afghan uh, security and intelligence uh, forces. The only capability that the Taliban and Haqqani and, and others that really developed over the, that tenure was to be very effective at employing, you know, um, IEDs, improvised explosive devices, and you know, mass casualty events to cause, you know, fear and intimidation in the population. And ultimately, um, you know, when we departed in August, and I recognize there's there were a lot of a lot of dialogue that took place leading up to that, but. You know, you had about anywhere estimated of thirty to fifty thousand Taliban uh, come into the country and over overwhelm a government and a people uh, of a fighting age male population of conservatively about thirteen million. That's just the male population. So, what, what does that tell us? That you know, you know, will and resolve matter the most, and you're seeing that play out in Ukraine right now with the Russian Federation and their illegal invasion of not only in 14, but, you know, the present this last February, that, you know, you look at the remarkable performance of the Ukraine people, despite the very tragic, um, you know, losses that have taken place of, of human life. And, and I would even extend that to the Russian Federation forces that are being, you know, forced to into this conflict for uh, some very <laughs> unfortunate, uh, you know, uh, desires on behalf of, uh, of of their president, but the will and resolve of those of those forces and the people, the population itself, to retain their sovereignty and to ultimately uh, com compel the Russian Federation to withdraw out of the country is is really impressive. And we can learn a lot as a military, and I think as you know, just as as civil society from from what we're seeing play out there. I think if there's one word that jumps off the page of that which you have written, it's the word relationship. And I think that same word holds true in the national security document that you encouraged me to read from our government, is the importance of relationships, plural, around the world, if we're going to achieve our goals. For you, as it was that first fostering the growth of individuals. That means you have to get to know that individual to the best of your ability, understand his or her goals, and then foster their growth and development. And then a relationship forms. That's what I gleaned from that which you've written in your bio and uh, other documents. 
um, relationships seem to be awfully important, not military force. Mm -hmm. yeah, relationships at the, like you said, at the individual level, all the way up to the, you know, the strategic level among nations. And I certainly didn't have that appreciation when I first had the opportunity to serve with a coalition of, you know, it was a small one, but my first experience in, in Afghanistan, we had a pretty small coalition with our special operations task force, maybe mainly um, the United Kingdoms and Australia and some other some other countries that came in early on. But as that where it really set home for me was when I had my first assignment in NATO and I had done one rotation in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And so I had certainly the experience of working with coalitions. Um, as a young, you know, young major, but I didn't understand the strategic importance of fostering that inclusion of you know, your Navy, your fellow NATO allies when you're putting together plans and strategy for uh, the what, what I was working on at the time was the expansion of NATO in, into Afghanistan. And you know, it's very easy to get frustrated when um, you're at the tactical level and you want to see your allies or partners do more, um, take on the same level of responsibility that you are. But you also have to realize that um, in, in some cases, they are providing you know what what they are capable of um, from a not just from a political standpoint, but even militarily. And not all, you know, not all nations are equal, not all capabilities are equal in internal to uh, security forces. But there's so much more to leverage um, besides, you know, that that an, an immediate tactical need that you're that you're focused on, maybe as a as a military planner. Again, that broad coalition and the statement that that makes strategically, not only you know collectively to your allies and partners, but as important to to your adversary is really important. But it does come down ultimately to relationships. And I, one of the things I'm very grateful for is over the course of really the last 20, 22 years, um, I built a lot of really close friends uh, and allies and that paid big dividends, especially when, you know, a contingency uh, comes up or you're planning on something, being able to leverage that because of, you know, Mark and John know each other versus um, you're just asking someone to do, do something because, you know, you need, you need assistance and you need their capability. That relationship can, can move, move things a lot faster, uh, especially in, in, in the planning phases. Mm -hmm. It forms the foundation of that structure as you move forward. Yeah, yeah well, we're, we're certainly seeing that in Ukraine today. And um, there's so much complexity to it. And the relationships uh, in NATO and around the world are as complex as they can be. Does it seem like we've made good decisions from your perspective? You, do you feel like an outsider now, or do you feel like you have so much knowledge, having been in the military, that you see things that the average citizen does not? Well, I I do uh, miss not being part of it. Uh, yeah. Because I again, I was at Special Operations Command in Europe from sixteen to eighteen, and um, actually, I was up in Washington D.C. at the Army. Uh, the Association of the United States Army Symposium, and I ran into a, a few of allies, guys that I had actually served with that had come over that not Ukraine uh, uh, leaders, but others that are, you know, working to support uh, Ukraine, but just came back uh, for a, a week or so for you know, some meetings and whatnot. But so I do miss that, uh, that uh, uh, experience and, you know, those friendships. Um, I am very uh, very impressed with how we're doing, not only from you know a military standpoint, but intelligence, and but collectively as as the alliance, and it really has put the NATO alliance back on its front foot and demonstrating their resolve uh, to a partner um, to to do all they can without escalating the conflict against an alliance member um, to ultimately compel Russia to the the part. Um, Ukraine. And it's going to be uh, a very difficult and challenging uh, time ahead, certainly. And it's, it's, it certainly has been to this point. But I think if, if NATO collectively and then the broader partnership and international community can, can maintain its resolve, um, the, I think ultimately that uh, Ukraine will, will prevail in, in what they're trying to accomplish in terms of reestablishing sovereignty of, of their borders. 
Do you think that in the course of this discussion so far that we've done a pretty good job of kind of going back over your military career? Or did I miss any major pieces in my questioning? Um, no, I think we covered most of the of the areas. Again, I I did have the opportunity, um, like like we talked earlier on, to like most officers do, and, and certainly even senior non commissioned officers now to to go and you know take time to get uh, additional education as, as part of our normal upbringing. And I think that's that's so important. And I I would say that <clears throat> during the course of my my military service. We even increase those opportunities at, at the more junior level for our officers and, and our non-commissioned officers, which I think is is fantastic. Mm. I was actually having a conversation with a current general officer now who works inside of, of special operations about, you know, there's there's so much benefit to um, exposing our our military leaders, particularly our lieutenant colonels and colonels, to you know, the broader um, academic opportunities that are, that are out there. Uh, historically, we, we have our military schools um, at, at each echelon, but there's opportunities. And I think uh, certainly as you get more senior, the more we can do to provide opportunities for fellowships to get uh, the broader population of, you know, in America exposed to military professionals, I think will benefit all of us because there's a lot of mis under, you know, misinterpretation or misunderstanding in terms of, you know, the military, where they get their, their direction and guidance from, their orders to do certain things. And I, I've even had <laughs> interactions with, with individuals who I think are, you know, really, uh, really turned on to, uh, you know, understanding uh, our, our national security system and, and how we work. But in my conversations, I realized that, you know, sometimes they're not that, you know, we don't just decide as military professionals that we're going to go off and, you know, uh, on some type of adventure, we're going <laughs> to, we take our direction and guidance from our, you know, our civil authority, right? Which right. Is, you know, the executive branch in the U.S. Congress, obviously. So, you know, I, what's been so fun for me in getting to know you is that I see a man who has had an extraordinary career, a career for which you exude gratitude. You are enormously grateful for the experiences that you had through your military service. And, but now you're a young man and you're on the launching pad for part two of your, uh, the, the, this next part of your life. Let's talk a little bit about that. What, what are your goals to date? I know you're still forming some of them. That's the hunch that I get is that you're still trying to figure out exactly where do I want to go next? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, transition from a life of a service is a, a very deliberate process. And I'm, I've been involved with that. I've learned a lot over the last, the last 10 months, but my ultimate um, dream would, would be to translate the, experiences that I have had as a leader at every level into uh, civil society and corporate society. So I would love to work as, you know, as, a, as, a, as an executive coach and mentor, uh, not just for the, you know, the most senior that are out working in corporate, uh, in the corporate world or civil society, but I love, um, you know, I, and I loved it in uniform of, of helping young leaders you know, work through uh, problems and, and leadership um, and dilemmas that that I certainly faced, and I I was blessed with with great individuals that I could I could leverage. And there's so many firsts when you start out as a young leader, and I'm confident that that's the case when you're, you have that first leadership or managerial position. You know, if you're working in, in a company or working for a nonprofit, etc. So I would love to do that. Um, I also enjoy you know, talking about my experiences, and I've had the opportunity on a couple of occasions to speak at, um, at classes at the University of Denver, and obviously the Air Force Academy due to geographic proximity, um, and so I, I really enjoy doing that. Um, I think inherent in the character of, of most Green Berets is our, you know, our ability to teach um, others, you know, and obviously in foreign countries, but I, I love doing that. And I certainly did love it in uniform. I, I want to continue that on when I have the, uh, have the opportunities to do so. And then, 
also, um, you know, I, I am very passionate about advocating for women and leadership. And so I've taken opportunities over the course, uh, certainly the latter few years of my military career, because um, I realized how important that, you know, just like for me, merit is, is first and foremost and potential, but then you have to take, you have to advocate and sponsor um, individuals if you want to see them succeed. And if you take underrepresented demographics, and in this case, you know, ladies within the military and civil society, you know, potential and um, merit isn't enough. It takes those that are in the majority to assist in creating those opportunities. And so I, I've had the opportunity to speak about this a couple of times with uh, different, different companies, and I hope to do that because um, it, it really is a, a complex, uh, I, I would say, you know, process of figuring out how to how to do it. How do I create more inclusion and within my organization or increase certain demographics? I mean, it 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 really isn't, um, you know, that that complex to do. It just takes leadership and it takes, you know, purposeful leadership at every level, starting with, you know, the CEO or president of an organization to set that tone. Um, so that's another area that I. Can, will continue to speak about and take opportunities to talk to others when they're trying to figure out, okay, how do I do that in, in my organization? So those are, those are the key areas that I, I, I'm enjoying working on now. And then, you know, again, serving as an advisor and getting involved with um, or, organizations that do have international um, uh, presence or want to grow presence because I, I love living outside the United States. And again, working with you know, a number of, of different nations, uh, even when I was, you know, in, in assignments here, here in the United States, both in the schoolhouse or through my own professional military education and, and units that uh, I was assigned to. So I hope to continue to do those types of things uh, going forward as well. As a group, we had the uh, great pleasure of traveling to Eastern Europe, to Latvia, and uh, part two of that trip was going to be St. Petersburg. And that didn't happen, but so we went to uh, Sweden for uh, part two of that trip. And uh, next year, you might recall that we're headed to Kenya. But because of COVID-19, our country is re-examining this particular historical phase of globalization that we, um, that our industry uh, has, uh, has um, led around the world and, and now we recognize that if 70% 70, 70 of surgical gloves are made in one factory in one country, that's not a good thing. Or, uh, or masks uh, and other um, PPE to protect our first responders, that we need to uh, maybe pull back some of the manufacturing here in the, the United States. But I don't think it's the end of globalization at all. I just think it's a rebalancing, um, and I think that you can play a tremendous role in helping businesses rethink this as, as we move forward. Does that stimulate any thinking on your part? Well, I, I believe that COVID-19 certainly exposed the level of strategic vulnerability that the United States and other, other nations around the world um, have. And, and continue to have. And so there is a, a deliberate push, not only here in the United States, but you know, other, I would say, like-minded democracies and even more broadly, um, just the international community to reduce that strategic vulnerability. And you know, China has does so much production uh, globally. And so the, the deliberate intent, uh, certainly by the current, administ current US administration for onshoring uh, capabilities and manufacturing that we've outsourced uh, to to China and, and other other locations as well, but I think China is is the paramount concern, um, and friendshoring too, working with you know countries like Australia, like the UK, uh, you know European countries that may not have the capability uh, right now, but the United States is certainly encouraging, and I think that's um, you know discussions that are going on within the European Union and, and certainly out in the Asia Pacific as well to talk to find ways to basically build a more robust supply chain because of the, of the literally tens of trillions of dollars that have been lost as a result of 
uh, this pandemic. So I, I see it as a, it is a great opportunity for uh, many, you know, I think I was at a conference uh, a few months ago and we were having this discussion and one of the individuals in the room, you know, talked about the billions of dollars it would cost to, to onshore a, a, a certain manufacturing capability. But I think too, you know, you got to look in the broader context of what it, the trillions of dollars that it, it's cost. Um, so that, that initial investment may be challenging and painful, uh, but I think if you're the challenges that exist now and what we're seeing uh, with with globalization and how quickly a, something like a pandemic, and this certainly won't be the last one, we've learned a lot, can have, we've got to do all we can collectively um, as civil society to find ways to mitigate this. And I think there's, uh, that's a, uh, I would say, a bipartisan um, view. I think everyone agrees that we need to do things to reduce our, our vulnerability and, and leverage those those allies and partners that you know have the have the technical capability and the capacity and and the, the desire to achieve those same uh, strategic objectives that the United States is is working towards. Mm -hmm. I sincerely hope you'll be doing more writing speaking and coaching in the future, because I know those are things that you love to do. And uh, you've agreed to speak to our group uh, next year, and I'm thrilled about that. And I hope that some of the topics we talked about today will be included in that discussion. Um, you know, working with uh, helping uh, women uh, move into leadership roles, and globalization, and leadership in general. There's a tremendous uh, book from Henry, Henry Kissinger on leadership that was published recently. He's 99 years old now, and uh, I'm having fun uh, just starting and uh, reading that book. And you too have a tremendous amount of experience to share, and you're going to do uh, even more of that. Do you have uh, plans for international travel? coming up? Because I think uh, many of the companies that you could serve uh, could be international in scope. Well, I, I love the travel. I did a lot of it while I, my wife and I were living, you know, outside of the United States. And yes, if opportunities come about to work with uh, international companies, I would I would welcome that. I think the, the other neat part of, of working with, you know, international um, organizations and, and companies and, and individuals is that they've got their own, you know, unique cultures that you have to be attuned to. Mm -hmm. Again, something that I was not necessarily um, good or sensitive to as a young officer, but certainly became more so um, you know, as I got more senior. So yes, I, I'd like to continue to uh, foster those skills that I've learned and, you know, practice uh, builds, you know, uh, expertise. So yes, I, I would enjoy the opportunity to do those things. Absolutely. I, I could also see you serving our government in, in different roles too. Uh, is that something of interest to you or would you prefer to um, work more in business today? Well, I, I, if I, if asked to serve, you never technically take off the uniform, right? So yeah. if, if asked to serve in some capacity, I, I think you have a responsibility to do that as long as you, you know, believe in, you know, the, the, the rationale for what, what you're being asked to do. And you believe in the leaders that, uh, you know, that you're asking to serve too, I think is, is real important, but yeah, I could, I could certainly, I would really enjoy if the, if the peace process ever gets back on track and you have two uh, individuals leading the Palestinian authority and, and the uh, the governor of Israel, I, I would love to play a part in that dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. I got to meet some of the individuals that really have put a lifetime of of their own service in trying to achieve, um, you know, a, a better life for the Palestinian people and ultimately, you know, security for the Israeli people and and life for quality of life for the Israeli people as well. And I, I would love to be to be a part of that at some point in the future if, if those opportunities come about. Yeah. Well, it's been a great pleasure for me to meet you and to get to know you uh, over the last couple of months. And I look forward to getting to know you better. And, and uh, you know, we have plans to do so. That's exciting for me. So I thank you so much for your time.
Any other? Do you have any other uh, closing uh, comments that you'd like to make? Uh, anything that we didn't cover today, or? Oh, John, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today. And there, there may be some things, but I think we had a an opportunity again to get to know each other a little bit better. And you know, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to talk about things that I'm uh, very interested in. What I what I value most about my service to our great nation and what I hope to do uh, going forward. So I look forward to our partnership as we move forward together. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your service, General Mark Schwartz. Bye for now.